more particular, we're not particular about the conceptualization of uh, migration, you know, per se, but to show how over time, uh, migration is becoming a synonymous factor with movement of people, uh, particularly movement of people uh, in, in individually to another uh, destination. So conventionally, we know that migration is viewed as a relative permanent movement of, um, of persons over a significant distances, as demonstrated by Shaw, cited in COP 1999. Although this definition for us is very misleading, as we have argued that, as we have argued that while or that this migration, be it national, regional, or international, that it has created some level of uh, confusion. For, and for us, whether migration is involves late women, children, or, or, or women, there is always a story by every migrant at the end of the other side. So that is why uh, 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 Deni have argued in his story, and he says that, look, every story by every migrant is the fact that many of them are even moving from frying pan to fire. This is stated in Adeni in 2019. He has also argued that 40% of mig migration takes place between the south and the north direction, while 37% is within the southern uh, countries. And these percentages to us is a reflection of the volume of people that move from one end of the, of, of one, uh, the country to another for desperate reasons. However, in terms of migration, we can say that it is a very big uh, statement in that international migration is questioned, questioned in the sense that uh, one is yet to come to the realization or understanding of the concept of migration on the basis of individual movement from one country to another, and then at the same time, may maintain the different reasons with which compounds the meaning of the term migration. What are we trying to say here? We are, we, are, we, we, are, we are saying that, look, even though migration entails quite a number of uh, de uh, definitions, that for us, our interest is the individual migration that actually takes place. So when you, when you lump up migration to mean uh, so many things in our own times, we say, no, that we are not interested in that. We are only interested in looking at the individuals and how they are able to integrate in the society. So, the, the migrants are simply those individuals for us or persons who willingly decide to move from one country to the other and then thereby underscore the, their own more personal reasons. So this argument for us is what we are interested in. And then the question we now ask for that is why migration? Now for us, we have also said that, look, migration is not a new concept in our present world. We, have, we agree that it's as old as humanity and yet it has found a new meaning and of course, a driving force. Now, these forces that drive my migration in our present world comparatively seems to be what is consonant with that which happens about four centuries ago. Now, this disparity is that in the present generation, migration, however, tends to be quite frequent with attendant migrant stereotyping. Now, the point we are trying to also raise here is that, look, people move, but is, was it the same thing that happened some four centuries ago? We are saying, yes, it has also been the same, but there are different uh, um, focus now with which migration is being known for. And just like uh, many years ago, Mark Laskabot quoted, and I quote, he says, several things make people leave their homeland, you know, uh, to abound, to, and abandon their homes. Now, the first with which he says is that, uh, people actually move for something better. And then the second, he says that, look, it is because there is a bustling of people that a particular place is overpopulated, hence they move. And then for him, the third reason is that it could be as a result of disputes, it could be as a result of quarrels, it could be as a result of uh, divisions that make people to move. Well, of course, we agree with you. This postulation is clear and reflect recent times also as development and literature literally translates to the idea of something better is truly a driving force. We agree with him. Yes, we agree that people can move when there is a driving force looking for something better. We agree. But more so also, within this period, there's this conflict and divisions 
which actually was the earliest driving force that people migrate from Africa. But that still, for us at this present generation, is very apt, you know. And then the other reasons which he says is a crowded society, uh, you know, for us does not count for present generation in the sense that migration, in the sense that we know that Nigeria, for instance, is highly populated, but that does not create, you know, uh, overcrowding and therefore provoke the desire to migrate to other societies. So for us, his argument in that regard does not count, you know, rather for us, we agree that it is educational, uh, educational uh, provisions that actually, you know, drive people to look for better opportunities or a driving force particularly in this generation. And then another uh, driving force is the corrupt practices of African leaders who had led, that has led to the neglect of the educational sector, thus undermining quality education in this part of the world. As most individual migrants, particularly young people uh, of this age, emigrate to assuage the need for a qualitative education, thereby leading to something better. The theoretical di dimension of such decision-based migration many scholars will attribute to micro operation orientation as the, you know, depicted by Lucas and Stark, 1985. However, on a macro understanding of such decision would naturally entail a concept of migration as an investment, which is primarily crucial in the reflection of both uh, the benefits and the costs associated with movement to one another, uh, other countries. Now, with the Global Commission on International Migration's adoption of this, his argument, which depicts uh, development, demography, and, uh, and uh, democracy, for us, it, become, it, it, it becomes very difficult for us to agree because the relative deprivation underscores the underdevelopment, social exclusion, and violence, on the other hand, underscores lack of fundamental human rights. But we are not intending with the view that the pressure on resources or unemployment is caused by excessive population growth. Rather, our own view is that the absence of good governance, politically wielded leadership, is what undermines resources and creates unemployment because resources are not equitably distributed. So this, to an extent, submerges or rapes democracy as it were. Now, the democratically analysis of the 3D is a, as, a fact, as a driving factor in this part of the world for us, particularly in Africa, is very reckless. And to us, we believe that it uh, resonates Malthusian scholarship. Whichever the orientation we might be coming from, be it classical, microeconomic, macro, or political economy, uh, migration serves a purpose of both entities. In other words, the receiving countries and the, the, the sending countries. So to a very large extent, uh, the push factor in this case will always, uh, will always interact with the pull factor, thereby ameliorating the decision to, to migrate. So what are the challenges of migrants? Now, of course, we know that uh, the, the world is heavily impacted today by the concept of globalization. And then, and migration, as you know, age-old boundaries are broken down, and the formerly isolated cities and metropolises that were equidistant from Africa have become even closer as they are merely flights away. Now, meaning that the world is more open or is borderless than it has ever been. Therefore, migration is not a misnomer. Neither is it an anathema, as many would also paint it to be. Now, the veritable challenges confronting migrants in the receiving countries have been an issue for discussion at various domestic and international fora. In the colonial era, we're all aware that Europeans in their millions immigrated to Africa and other parts of the world. And in many cases, we are not largely, we are not largely welcome without the promulgation of stereotypical laws. Now, what are we saying here? We are saying that during the colonial era, these Europeans came over to their various colonies. Nobody stereotyped them. Nobody, there was no law that was promulgated against them. They interacted. And it is also on record that 
62 million Europeans moved to the various colonies around the world in the 19th and the 21st centuries. Now, and one of the major challenges that migrants usually face is that of labeling. And of course, it's a major challenge in the sense that there is also resistance and non-acceptance of migrants. And this is usually met with the teacher's finger pointing. And the rationale behind this is the recipient authorities to make a pronouncement of rejection, particularly on the side of the migrants. Now, for instance, it is on record that in 2015, the populists, uh, populists and the nationalists in, uh, in Germany accused Angela Merkel's government of permitting European societies to be overrun by Muslim migrants from a cage society, according to Rodriguez. You know, uh, this is exemplified in the report of the New Year Eve in Cologne, 2015 and 2016, where North African and Muslim men were accused of sexual assault and attacks, portraying in the media as mainly targeting white German women in the main train station, Rodriguez 2018. Now, as Rodriguez portrayed it, the idea was not totally to conjure up the emotion of, the idea was totally to conjure up the emotion of hatred towards the migrants, especially those from Africa. And then to also engineer the irreconcilable differences of European civilization and African barbarity. Now, thus, constructing African migrants as pre-modern men and lacking the ability to con control their sexuality as a result of their patriarchal and misogynist mindset. Now, scholarly, scholars have also found and argued that many recipient communities are not receptive or friendly towards migrants, basically for the fear of losing particularly the, the, the uh, resource, valuable resources such as land, increase in strength in labor market, pressure on the social infrastructure, and a rise in crime. You know, and these, uh, these cases to today are still part of the things that migrants are also uh, facing. And such non-recipient countries end up, in a, uh, end up uh, with some form of resistance. And to a very large extent, they are, they are also stereotypes. And then it, we have also argued that the willingness not to accept nor embrace these migrants could generate various virulent vegetations against migrants, especially those who are from Africa, perhaps because of the color of their skin and not because of the content of their character. Now, recently uh, it's in the news that young uh, Africans in China were being molested, embarrassed, and even chased out of their appointment. The Chinese labeled these migrants as carriers of the coronavirus. virus. This was carried in the BBC and Sun newspaper of 2020. Now, another point in time is that which uh, the United States President Donald Trump had banned certain countries from migrating to the USA. That, you know, he, he, he targeted and selected certain African countries, such as and Venezuela and certain Middle East countries. Now, his argument, particularly also recently, was the fact that there should be a halt for 60 days by the US government using the coronavirus pandemic as an excuse. Now, for us, what is more policy wise, the recipient countries have made promulgations that are considered inimical to migrants. Now, in that, for us, we have argued that sometimes finding jobs and affordable housing with linkages to transportation routes, as well as the opportunity for education, for education remains a very critical uh, factor for any migrant, as this infrastructure, where as it were, is also crucial to migrate into the new, uh, to integrate into the new environment. So we ask the question, what are the benefits of migration? Apparently, this section, we intend to demonstrate that migration is not in any way an anathema or unwanted, but a very veritable phenomenon that many countries, on the contrary, relish and, and gain so much from. Now, over the years, a series of questions have been posed on to whether migration is wanted or unwanted. Now, whether it should be forbidden or tougher policies developed to reinforce the natives of the recipient countries. Deliberately, this paper is not concerned on the, uh, it's not concerned 
It's clearly looking at the impact of migration on the sandy countries. Thus, the focus at Benicio is on the receiving uh, countries. The import of migrants to any receiving countries cannot be overemphasized, as migrants over the time tend to display some diverse cultures within their host uh, community. Now, countries that have attracted migrants from several geopolitical regions tends to even enjoy a myriad of cultural, uh, 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 cultural uh, riches in those societies. Although not all cultures are, uh, you know, are accepted uh, by the host community, uh, some cultures practice some cultural practices consider are uh, considered extreme and inhuman. An e example of this is uh, the female genital uh, mutilation, where migrants are mistreated. Now, notwithstanding the negative impact of migration on the host population, um, there are some cases where host population benefit immensely from migrants through cultural assimilation and, in, and introduction of new economic practices, as uh, demonstrated of, by Scaled on 2001. Now for us, social cohesion in this instance is induced by certain values such as trust, equality, and respect for one another. However, these elements are not always present in every situation as some societies will always display coercive tendencies, coercive tendencies to, delimit, to a limited period while pursuing a very common agenda. And then they will also disperse as soon as these objectives are met. Now, studies have also shown that migrants are more entrepreneurial than their native population. Uh, for instance, that Morphe have also argued that migrants have made so much different achievements, you know, and very entrepreneurial in China and the United States. Their, their argument was that, for instance, in China, 25% of immigrants are self-employed and they are involved with trade in their host uh, community. Now, they have also argued that 25% of uh, uh, US inter, uh, migrants are entrepreneurs in the United States. Though literatures are inexhaustive in this, in the import of uh, migration on the recipient countries, our interest is in fact how European countries in, in presently have an aging population. And as such, the emergence and the presence of migrants in such society would also aid, aid uh, production. So although migration cannot totally accommodate the challenges of an aging population, but best, they can provide time to face in, in, in entitlement and other reforms which are still necessary in many countries. Now, this is a very uh, good example of what is actually happening in Italy, where you find out that they have a very, a very aging population. So you find out that most African migrants want to move to that country, even though they are facing challenges. So to some of those societies, they accept them. For us, the catch here, therefore, is that Migrants are more likely to, to be of working age, and then they are, they are skilled more than the existing population, and therefore they are more likely to contribute to public finance. In another context, studies have also revealed that since migrants are usually educated, some of the migrants are usually educated, they can also ignite a lot of changes in society, particularly in job creation. Now, some scholars have argue that higher immigration leads to more jobs and creation of uh, higher demands for people further down the job ladder. Though some argument that they, they, they have maintained that highly educated immigrants contribute to the growth of wages and uh, that existing uh, society. The implication here therefore is that migrants of African origin, Asia, Middle East, uh, surpass the idea of whether they are wanted in Europe or the E. OECD countries, or even in North America. Rather, evidences have shown that it is, that it, it is a testimony of how, how quintessential migrants are to those economies acting so much as development uh, agents. So for us, we are concluding in uh, looking at the benefits of migration here to, to say that uh, though migrants apparently are confronted with equivalent challenges on arrival, 
on the other side of ah, this does not also lead to the fact that they have not contributed immensely to the development of uh, such society. Now, we, we, we take a look at the social integration society and who determines it. Now, for us, this is the major, the major focus of this paper. Now, we begin by asking uh, what should be done to manage and er eradicate the challenges of migration. The answer seems clear from the title of this work, and this is that social integration of migrants into a receiving country is very critical to the extent that we should be responsible, to the extent that we ask that who should be responsible for this social integration, and how do we move from dehumanization of, mig of migrants to decolonization? Now, social integration, according to Ferguson, is a process of building values, relations, and institutions necessary to achieve that society. In other words, a society for all. In her argument, she further argued that social development is to build a society where all and sundry will have equal opportunity of purpose, and this is quite possible, where there are instances or existence of institutions that will promote peace for all, and then also apply the principle of social justice. The, 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 as the arrival of migrants in the receiving countries is usually greeted with great expectations. Now, such expectation for us needs a very decent uh, environment and requires support for fulfillment. Um, social exclusion, to a very large extent, is in no doubt that, that that recipient countries must enable migrants to have the capacity to fight against poverty, where stereotyping becomes institutionalized. The danger is that it would necessarily lead to colonial perception of migrants and totally total resistance to the building of a social network of friendliness. And where migrants become very unruly, it is the response of these colonial perception, particularly on dehumanizing interests. We conclude by saying that there are many reasons for migrants, you know, uh, that on the underline social uh, integration. Now, many reasons for us in this direction is the fact that the concept of migration or migrant is also depicted here to a very large extent that it has underscored the effort in moving the challenges that migrants face upon an, an, an arrival. And then the successful integration requires a meaningful interaction between the migrants and the receiving society, which means that the integration must be coercive and there must be in two ways or a two process in that the host society must ensure that migrants have the opportunity to participate in economic, social, as well as civil life. Equally, migrants are expected to respect the fundamental norms and values of the host society and participate actively in the integration process through, though they are not expected to relinquish their own identity. Policy framework must be in place to socially integrate migrants and such policy instruments must particularly focus on the recognition of the diversity, the redistribution of socioeconomic resources, and of course, that of representation of political voices. Therefore, beyond the realms of this, we must give priority to uh, creating citizenship enlightenment for the creation of social integration, and the responsibility for doing this social must lie on the state, and not only the state, but individuals or citizens who have um, a citizen but also have the capacity to build network and embrace or accommodate members of uh, new society, particularly those who are foreigners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yuli, for the brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, I do not see any hands up yet. Uh, let me stop sharing and then uh, hopefully see more people. Uh, if you have not identified, okay, I can see Dr. Ngobiri raising up a hand. When I said hands up, I expect all of you to use the emicon. That gives me an idea of uh, who it is. So Dr. Ngobiri will go after my first question. Uh, please, if you're unable to use the emicon to say you're raising up your hand, then you can just do what she is doing right now. Uh, we've listened to uh, what I will call
call a great deal of conceptualization of migration and social integration. And the first question that I you know, put down is uh, whether the empirical evidence. An element of empirical evidence came about when he mentioned uh, World War II and the consequences. And it's so germane and important in the era of uh, the celebration of the 78th anniversary of uh, the end of World War II. Of course, some people will argue that migration in that context was primarily for the benefit of the colonial powers. But I can also argue, uh, based on evidence and you know, teaching this particular area of decolonization in the last 32 years, that indeed uh, it reflected positively in the colonies. You will see the you know, continuous migration or the influence of reforms that the colonization is all about, uh, whether false on the colonial masters or they willingly give or decided to reform after 1945. You can see an element of Igbo people, for instance, uh, migrating to the north, the Aousa migrating to the southwest. And then the Yoruba is also migrating to the west or even the west coast of Africa. But the idea of social integration, uh, if we can recall last week's uh, presentation uh, on the book uh, presentation, whereby we talked about the Lebanese, the Lebanese being the only group that refused to be integrated. And I'm wondering whether the presenter can shed more light into that. Uh, the other thing is how successful as social integration be in the context of migration. How successful have they been able to recreate themselves within the conceptual framework of double consciousness as propounded by Lisa uh, uh, a scholar in North Carolina, or the triadic relationship, meaning that they recreate themselves, remembering where they are from. Or in recent time, how successful has it been? Can we use, for instance, Lagos or Cross River or some other state whereby, even in Niger State, I recently discovered that non indigents quote unquote, were appointed as commissioners or even as essay. So how do we, you know, beyond the concept, how do we give empirical evidence? Do we have more? Can you shed more light on that? So I'll allow uh, Dr. Nweberi to speak. Let me unmute. I would have loved to unmute everybody, but I don't want us to listen to your dogs and uh, some other noises that may distract us. So, Dr. Nguberi, please speak. Do I have the floor, sir? HOD must come. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah, yeah, no doubt this is a okay, wonderful go ahead. as you have. Do I have the floor? Hello, sir. Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Okay, let me just go and talk. Thank you, Prof. Sir. No doubt is a very beautiful lecture as you have already observed, but I want to quickly ask three questions. The first one, when the presenter was discussing the concept of migration, he said that for them, uh, migration reflects to those who freely move. My question here is, what is the consideration for these alamajiris that are being moved? They are not moving freely. <laughs> Most of them are minors who don't even have a mind of themselves, of their own, to say, I want to move so how, how how do you consider that are they not migrants? That's question number one. Number two, under benefits, he also mentioned that migrants are poor entrepreneurs. I don't understand what that means. And then he went off to give example that, for instance, in China, twenty five percent of migrants are self employed. 
So what's the implication of whose benefit is this? Is it to the migrants themselves or their own? Which country? Because some of the European countries, especially when it is coming, they don't support them because they have you can throw Okay, uh, Dr. Mubiri, uh, unfortunately, uh, you were in and out, and I believe, uh, I hope that uh, Dr. Yuli captured uh, some of your uh, comments and questions. Uh, Dr. Yuli, can you kindly respond to uh, the question or comments that I made, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Mubiri? Please, if you would like to ask questions or make a comment, kindly raise up your hand like that, or you use the emicon. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone doing that. So please, well, we have two now. So uh, Dr. Yuli, you, the floor is yours. Hello, bro, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, yeah, there are, there are empirical evidences, you know, uh, you know, because this is, uh, because the paper may not be able to accommodate some of these findings. If you, we have some of these statistics, particularly in the main paper, where there are empirical evidences, remember that we are saying that our interest, particularly in this discourse, uh, has to do with individuals. Now, if, if and, uh, we have also argued that, you know, during the colonial era, where people migrated, particularly to Africa, and our major focus, if we are saying is that, look, there, there is more migration from the south to the north. And then there is also less migration from the south, uh, from the north down south. Now, it, it all depends on the receiving society. Now, our, our argument is that, look, if the receiving society have that uh, enable environment for, for those migrants to socially integrate, the willingness on the part of that migrant will always be there. And so that, uh, that's why we conclude by saying that, look, citizens must be. Now, the argument is in two, in two phases. Now, as Africans, we know we have this hosp uh, ho uh, hospitable uh, attitude towards visitors. That is part of our culture, is part of our way of life. It might not be the same way, you know, uh, it, it, the same way to, in other societies. But if the argument in this direction is that, look, we accepted them the way they came, we didn't stereotype them, we are talking about stereotyping here in this case. Now, if those Re Lebanese who had migrated to the north, particularly in Kano, which was the, in that book that we looked at last week, if they have chosen within their own tradition not to integrate into the, the society, you know, it's not left for them to, to, to find out or strike a balance because I know that they make a living in that society. So if socially they, did not, they don't, don't want to integrate, remember, uh, relig relig religiously they, they might integrate because they also have come to a particular place. So they are, they are cultural variables that encourages them to integrate. So in integration in this direction for us is, uh, is, is individualistic. It's, it's something that the individual must be willing to do at his own peril. Now, uh, we, have, uh, I ha we have empirical evidences in the main work which you have put together. I'm sure by the time we send that to you, you will see. On uh, the social, uh, a successful social integration has to do basically with, within the context of a very given environment. Remember, not all, or not all environments are friendly. Some environment, if, you know, just like uh, we, I go to a place and I don't like their way of life. I had said that some of the things that were not even accepted by the European nations from Africa was the issue of uh, female genital mutilation. Now, this is a very social, it's a social and health issue. Now, for them, they feel it's a barbaric one. And so, to that extent, 
that particular uh, way of life of the Africans might not be accepted. So in that regard, it's not, it's, not, it's not acceptable. But there are other forms of cultures. You know, remember, we have also, if you go to very, various parts of the world, particularly in Brazil, you will see African cultures. These are societies where African cultures have successfully, uh, you know, thrived. And then there is assimilation, there is social acceptance. They are also in, uh, trading with one another. Now, another thing that has reduced some of this or encourage social integration is globalization, which we mentioned. Now, countries that were borders and far away, borders are no longer there. I mean, one can all just a flight away wherever you want to be. So there is that uh, interconnectedness that has brought uh, various parts of the world together, socially, economically, and politically. So these are all forms of social integration that, in, to a very large extent, encourages successful social integration. Now, the second question on the conceptualization of uh, migrants, and she's bringing, she's asking about what are the, uh, the positions of Almagerists if they are forcefully moved here and there. Remember, for us here, we are saying that individual migration, that's the focus of our, our, our discourse here, is the willingness for you to move. So is, we are not looking at, we didn't, we, did, we, were, we were not uh, looking at the Amadjuris, but remember, some of them also have the willingness to move. Some of them are also integrating in societies where they feel that they're very comfortable. Now, well, from the point, point of which uh, the, the VC, you know, uh, draw, drew our attention to last week on the meaning and concept of Amadjuris, well, for me, uh, it, it has a new meaning. We live in a different era now where the concept of um, um, marjories has been misinterpreted. It's been given a new dimension. So how do you integrate such uh, characters? Becomes a challenge now, particularly to the receiving society. Now, how many societies are ready to receive these two children? Do they have the facility? Can they provide to them? And that is where the institutions come in. So we are saying that it, the states or the receiving states should ensure that institutions are put in place so that you can accommodate these people who are either willingly or forcefully in, their, in your own context, coming into their states, per se. Then on the benefits and co or what, uh, of entrepreneurs, and then we talked about the uh, migrants or the Nigerians in, uh, in China and as entrepreneurs. Well, if you go and then you trade in a place, and then maybe remember that most of the goods that are imported from China, that are businesses that are run by Nigerians, are being shipped down. They own these businesses. They do these businesses. So you ask who benefits. It's, it's a two-way thing now. The host community benefits because they are, they've created um, enable um, uh, they've created employment for their people. And then the receiving uh, countries or uh, the receiving country where they are shipping their goods home. They, remember, we said they are in trade with their host uh, nation. So when they ship it back, the other country is also benefiting. So it becomes a two-way thing. Now, I didn't actually understand uh, the, the second question because you were off and on. And then you talked about non-acceptance of migrants. Well, that is why we have argued that institutions, the citizens themselves, must collaborate to accept these persons and not to stereotype them or see them as unwanted citizens of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we will take in this order, Dr. Erema Orie, I've unmuted you, and then followed by Dr. Oyebode, I've also unmuted you. So we quickly take their comments or questions. Dr. Erema. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you to the presenter. My, my reaction is in terms of the conceptual analysis, I think part of the challenge we have is that you did a lot of conceptual clarification, that uh, a lot of conceptualization that at the end, we didn't know what your own view is concerning the, the concept, which, which is your own view concerning the uh, migration. Because uh, you have told us about what was our to now know what you have harnessed for me, or whether you disagree with entirely all of them, and then will give us your own uh, definition or concept, which you now use in the in, in, in the paper for your presentation. Then 
I, I saw that most of the discussion is also on international uh, migration. Meanwhile, you, you tend to respond to issues of uh, uh, Nigeria and all that. I thought you were discussing more of international uh, migration, which you will have captured in your conceptual analysis so that anybody asks will not, will not know exactly what you are discussing, whether it's just international beat or you are discussing both of them. But I saw more of the international aspect. Secondly, uh, when you, in your conclusion, you alluded to the fact that uh, there's need for policy framework to ensure integration of the uh, uh, migrants. But in most of the discussions, you didn't now give us probably empirical data as to the benefit of using policy in ensuring that the, the migrants are well integrated into the host community. Uh, so that, will keep, that kept me now wondering, is the conclusion actually uh, derived from this your analysis because of that lack of data and lack of uh, nexus? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Dr. Yebode. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate the presenter. I just want to point on two things. One, the methodology. Though you have not announced the methodology you have used to host, but I want to assume that uh, probably what you have done is a, a review of a 16 uh, literature on this, um, and probably, uh, I mean, giving us your own position as well. Okay, it's permissible anyway, given the situation of lockdown we have on ground. But I think if you had used uh, a, a, another methodology of uh, probably using uh, a questionnaire, uh, which can be administered through uh, telephone, uh, email, etc. And probably people like Professor uh, Ibifuli and others who have had the privilege of traveling abroad will give us more empirical uh, evidences of uh, what you are trying to talk about. Um, probably you may find it, you may find that uh, the situation may be different from uh, one person to the other. For example, if people migrate for economic reasons, the ones that are not skilled may probably experience something different from some, some people are skilled or rich migrants. For example, people have uh, left uh, the south of uh, Africa uh, with uh, our patrimony to settle in uh, Britain, US. Do they also suffer this uh, social um, exclusion like we are presented? So we need empirical uh, evidence in future for this kind of uh, attack. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also quickly say that we will take Dr. Adegoke, and it seems he's going to be the last because of time. Uh, before Dr. Adegoke speaks, let's uh, also note that some of the papers, uh, the presentation rather, uh, could be, you know, uh, review, reward, and then uh, submitted for peer review. We hope to have a maiden journal of the center uh, by August or September, hopefully, between September and October. So kindly bear that in mind. The fact that you have not presented or you did not present, let's say between when we started and say July or August does not mean you cannot submit paper for peer review, okay? So I just want to throw that in there. The second thing also, and of course it's voluntary, you know, we are not forcing anybody to either present or bring your paper for peer review and to be included in the, in the, in the um, journal. Let me also say this before I forget. As some of you know, and I could see some of the authors uh, in this book that uh, is currently uh, being reviewed and it will be published because we have a contract from Peggy Macmillan, New York, that uh, I am, as the editor, I'm looking for at least one or two uh, chapters that I think would be ideal to include in that uh, book that is about teaching and learning, uh, that you can talk about COVID-19 and how has it changed the uh, methodology, pedagogy of teaching and learning. You can privately chat with me or call me and then we discuss that. Okay. We still are looking for uh, one or two chapters, but specifically about COVID-19. Thank you very much. Dr. Adigoke. Thank you, sir. 
You're Good welcome. morning. Uh, I want to congratulate the presenter. For my, uh, my question is this, is there any theory which can be used to explain integration? Okay. I'm you looking at the theoretical framework. Okay. Because in the, in the paper presented, the, the presenter did not even mention uh, theoretical framework. Like you said, maybe after look at it, then maybe when it's presented for publication. Okay, thank you. Let me, let me add also that what I sent to all of you, what we shared on Telegram, what I've just shared on the WhatsApp group, and Telegram group, is just the PowerPoint. It's not actually the paper. And we all know the difference between the actual paper and the PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a synopsis of you know, whatever ideas we put in the full paper. And hopefully, the, uh, Dr. Yuli can quickly answer that, and then we can uh, round up. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuli. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Irema. Uh, thank you very much, Ma. Uh, well, the, the argument on uh, the conceptualization or conceptual analysis, you know, I quite a lot of, uh, I agree with you, but in the main paper, uh, we, had also, uh, we had also done, and then I, we have, actually my argument here is basically not on migration. But however, we have looked at migration from our own perspective, and we say it has to do with individual movement. So we might agree on that. So, but our major focus is the social integration towards development. And then we are saying that these migrants, to a very large extent, have contributed. But I have I've taken note of that. And then you also noted that uh, the work is more or less centered on international migration. And whereas I have also looked at, uh, I was answering a question on the Amadjeris. Well, there is no doubt. Remember, whether uh, international or local, migration is migration. Uh, and I've also analyzed from that perspective that people move south north and then people also move north south so whichever way migration is migration so so it's it's uh both ways uh so if you want us to look at it from the perspective of the local migration i think it's also captured in the in the main paper and we have also looked at some uh some analysis also we have also have, we have some of some of uh, some analysis and then on the need for policy framework to be used and then in the conclusion well remember it's a powerpoint our conclusion uh, is derived from our argument particularly um, in the literatures that we went through just like uh, professor uh, dr Oyebode was asking on uh, the methodology that was used well, of course, we know that this is a desk research, but if I want to go into uh, uh, going, you know, expand it further, I could do interview. The choice is mine. But in this case, we do not want to bother us. It's not because of the COVID-19, but we felt that looking at existing literatures will also make us have some uh, basic argument that we can arrive at a conclusion and a very convincing one for that matter, you know. Uh, uh, Dr. Adegoke, thank you very much. Uh, the theoretical approach to this study is actually in the main work. We didn't want to bug and uh, uh, because of the time frame, we didn't want to actually put that, but I, that could be an oversight. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you very much for all the comments and uh, questions. We want to thank and congratulate the the presenter, Dr. Emina William Uli. I do not see any hands up. I think we are running up today right on time. Uh, let me advise the presenter to liaise with uh, Dr. Ebele, the HOD of Political Science. I think she has uh, a useful uh, public on international migration. Uh, I can't remember the title now. And I think uh, if you private chat, uh, Dr. Billy, uh, she will definitely share 
uh, intellectual property, and there are some other uh, scholars, also other colleagues that you can also benefit from. I thank each and every one of you, stay blessed, uh, who is chatting me. I thank you very much. Say, oh, 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 okay, there's one Dr. Adimula. Dr. Adimula is raising up his hand, or a hand. Dr. Adimula is one of our, you know, the external people. You see, this thing is growing. Dr. Adimula, if you dare, can you quickly uh, speak? What Adimula, I was told you were raising up your hand. Good morning. Good morning. Can you introduce yourself? Yes. Um, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes, we can. We can hear you. My name is Dr. Biola Adimula. I'm a lecturer at the Center for Peace and Strategic Studies, University of Lorraine. Um, I want to congratulate the organizers of this of this uh, event. Uh, it's so exciting, and uh, this is exactly where the world is going to now, educationally. Um, I listened to the presentation and some of the, the um, information given by Professor Tijani and. I'm not sure whether there is, uh, especially in respect of the call for paper and the peer review thing for a journal. I've not actually seen a call for paper. I only stumbled on this uh, Zoom uh, um, lecture yesterday, and I decided to join in. And I want to find out whether Thank there is a call for paper, whether it's only for migration or there are other areas of studies that will be included. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adimola. For those who do not know, she is the, uh, is the president of the Association of Commonwealth uh, Scholars and Fellows, uh, if I'm getting it right. Um, <laughs> As a, as a Commonwealth scholar, as a Commonwealth scholar at the University of London, I, I'm a member, uh, and uh, I think she is yes, the sir. current president. And she's also a fellow of the Society for Peace and Practice. Uh, very dynamic. To answer your question, Ma, we will let you know. Yes, we will let each and every one of you know if we are going to do a call for paper. Uh, we will let you know. But again, it is open. You can private chat with me, and then uh, we are in it together. Again, I thank each and every one of you. Dr. Mutiat Olawale, we thank you. Uh, there are some people that I'm seeing for the first time. Uh, we really thank you, Dr. Badmos Ayodeji, uh, Dr. Apata, Dr. Rosemary Saidu, and the Rotimi, and the host of others that are non, you know, uh, NOUN staff. Dr. Ogunlela, thank you. If I didn't mention your name, please, I apologize. I can't mention 70-something names. Uh, it's, it's because I'm just going through the pictures. Uh, I thank each and every one of you. And uh, next week, oh, I should thank uh, our Baba. I can see Professor Okorunko in the house. I uh, thank you, sir, for finding the time. I don't think the VC was able to join us today, as well as uh, Professor Emeritus Sogolo. But I thank each and every one of you. Stay blessed and bye-bye. Uh, uh, let me unmute bye -bye. as in a tradition. Bye -bye. I say bye. 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 Good to see everyone. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.